Welcome. I'm Nathalie Ferrier, Higgins Art Gallery Director and Curator. The gallery is now open to the public Wednesday and Thursday from 12 to 5 p.m. and Friday from 11 to 5 p.m. and by appointment. The exhibition Timothy Horn Amber Room will be on view until October 28. Next Thursday, October 21st, you are all invited to an in-person reception with the artist. It will be from 5 to 7 p.m. So please stop by and you can meet Tim and see the beautiful show Amber Room. Before we start, I would like to let you know that we will do questions and answers at the end of Tim's presentation. So please submit your questions using the Q and A functions at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to use the chat anytime for posting your comments. Thank you. It is my great pleasure to introduce Timothy Horn, Cape Cod Community College Artist in Residence. On behalf of Cape Cod Community College, I would like to thank uh, Timothy for lending his magical, monumental, and graceful sugar car carriage to Higgins Art Gallery. The carriage has traveled directly from the Smithsonian Renwick Art Gallery in Washington, D.C. to our college, and we are honored to host such a sculpture. Thank you so much, Tim. Timothy Horn's exhibition is titled Amber Room, with works inspired by the Russian Tsarina Catherine the Great's fabled Amber Room. Horn lives and works in Truro, Massachusetts. He was born in Melbourne, Australia, and he studied sculpture at the Victorian College of the Arts and then glass at the Australian National University. He received a Sam Stagg scholarship uh, in the US. Um, so basically that br brought him to the US in 2002, where he completed graduate study at Massachusetts College of Art. Horn's work has been featured in exhibitions at the Renwick Gallery in Washington, DC, the, the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, the De Jong Museum in San Francisco, the San Jose ICA, the De Cordova Museum in Massachusetts, uh, the GOMA in Brisbane, and the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. Horn has received grants from the Pollock Krasner Foundation, Massachusetts Cultural Council, LEF New England, the Australia Council, and the Queen Elizabeth II Silver Ju Jubilee Award. Residencies include the British Academy in Rome, Yaddo in upstate New York, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, and the Lux Art Institute in Southern California. So the focus of Timothy Horn's work is the meeting point between the natural and constructed worlds where he attempts to locate the area of slippage between the organic and artificial. Horn's play on scale challenges our notions of masculinity and femininity, but he also chooses to work with unexpected materials for their inherent physical and metaphorical qualities. Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much, Natalie. And thank you so much to the Children Arts Centre and Cape Cod Community College for making this happen. So as Natalie said, I was born and grew up in the city of Melbourne in the southeast corner of Australia. For anyone who doesn't know Melbourne, Melbourne feels a lot like Boston. It has fine museums, good universities, and great food. Growing up, I spent a lot of time on the Mornington Peninsula, which is a cape that extends east out of Melbourne, very similar to Cape Cod, only in reverse. On one side of the Mornington Peninsula, you have a protected bay, like the Cape Cod Bay, 
on the other side is the Pacific Ocean, which extends all the way to Antarctica. I went off to art school thinking I was going to become a jeweler, but I found the scale and physicality of sculpture was a better fit for me. On the left is Degas' Little Dancer from 1880. Inspired, inspired by Degas' Dancer, I made a series of life-size figurative works. I modeled the figures in clay and then cast the sections using cement. Then stacked the cement sections together using gravity to hold them together. Melbourne has a lot of colonial era architecture that was financed by the discovery of gold just outside Melbourne in the 1850s. It came to be known as boom style architecture, lacy, heavily ornamented architecture that was about displaying that newfound wealth. I was inspired by some of those architectural features to create a series of works that operated as fountains. This was from a student show that we mounted in the moat that surrounds the National Gallery in Melbourne. While I was a student, I worked part-time in a bronze casting foundry. Art school is a great place for receiving an art education, but industry, industrial experience is also a great place to learn skills and technique. So this was my um, first solo show outside of art school in 1992. I made nine works based on historical objects. I modeled the objects in wax and then cast them in aluminum. This took about two years to complete. The inspiration for the work came from Dutch still life and genre paintings like this work by Johannes Vermeer. The, the music lesson from 1665. There's a quiet intimacy about Vermeer's paintings, but the objects are also part of the story. And with the work I made, I wanted the figures to recede and the viewer who came to see the show to be able to interact with the objects. It was important for me um, that the objects were in their true scale so that the viewer could relate to them in that way. The orchestral harp is based on a French harp that belongs to the Museum of Natural, uh, sorry, the Museum of Musical Instruments in Paris. I found some pictures of the harp in a book and they served as my model. All the, the detail in the original French harp, the flowers and the foliage, is painted in a trompe l'oeil style. But in making this harp, I wanted to create the, the painted form in 3D, in three dimensions, like it had sprung to life. And the natural form was taken over. This, this work is also a bit of a self-portrait. It has my initials in the top corner, and there is a small mermaid and a seahorse on the foot of the harp. This is another view of the work. Um, there's a harpsichord, a guitar, two tambourines, a chandelier on the floor, and a mirror on the wall. In 1993, I packed up my studio and went to Europe for the first time. I traveled around for several months, visiting museums and galleries, and then I settled for a while in Paris. I first got a job scrubbing dishes in a restaurant and then, then uh, secured a job teaching English. I didn't have a studio during that time, but I made lots of drawings and collected source material in visual diaries. This is a drawing I made on a trip to Florence. Standing in the queue to buy a ticket to get into the Palazzo Pitti, on the wall there was a large poster of a Renaissance era Medici pendant in the form of a little mermaid known as La Sirenetta. I made the drawing, uh, but I never got to see the original as the jewelry section in the museum was closed for renovation. But somehow seeing this tiny jewel blown up large in the poster gave me license to imagine remaking this work at a large scale. In 1997, I went back to Australia. I decided I really wanted to learn all all about glass and combine 
with, as a material with cast metal. I applied for the glass program at the Australian University in the city of Canberra. And using the story, using the drawing of La Sirenetta, I blew up my drawing on a photocopy to the, to the scale of four and a half feet and then set out about recreating it. The Sirenetta is a pagan symbol that was revived during the Renaissance. It represents an allegory of beauty, vanity, and the fleeting nature of time, as suggested by the hourglass. I decided to give the, the mermaid a gender reassignment and turn her into a merman, and locate this work in the realm of that part of gay male culture that obsessed, that's obsessed with body, looks, and youth. It's made of cast bronze that I, nickel, that I then nickel plated and the gold gems are cast crystal. The pearl forms are mirrored blown glass and it's four and a half feet in length. Alongside the drawings that I made in Europe, I'd also started collecting images of 17th and 18th century French jewelry. This is a pattern by Gilles Lugaret, court jeweler to Louis XIV that was a brooch in the shape of a bow. Again, I blew up the small image of the pattern on a photocopier to a two and a, uh, so it was two and a half feet wide and then used that blown up pattern uh, as my guide to recreate the bow at the scale. I modeled the framework in wax and cast it in bronze. And the gem forms in wax and cast in crystal. To make this work, I cut and pasted the shape of the bow into the form of a glass slipper and then fabricated it using the same techniques. The frame for the nickel, the, the, the frame for the slipper is nickel plated bronze and the gems are cast crystal. The heel Did is also. Would you like to tell us the, the dimension of, of this piece? It's two and a half feet long and one and a half feet high. And the title is Glass Slipper Ugly Blister, which is Cockney rhyming slang. On the left is uh, a photograph of my maternal grandmother, Doris, taken around 1928. On the right, wearing a double breasted suit and sporting a cigar. That's also my grandmother, Doris, dressed in her father's best Sunday suit for a laugh. My grandmother died when I was about five years old, and I remember first seeing these photographs when my parents were going through some boxes of her things. This is another photograph from the late 1920s. It's my grandmother's family dressed up going to a village ball. That's my grandmother on the far left. Again, she's wearing male attire, this time dressed as an 18th century dandy. At age five, I didn't have the vocabulary or the life experience to know what constitutes queer identity, but I had the innate embryonic awareness to be searching for signposts pointing the way and anchors to cling to. The images of Doris as an 18th century dandy became lodged in my mind's eye and somehow became enmeshed in my psyche. And remembering these photos many years later, they, be they became the basis for the body of work I put together called Cinderella Complex, which I saw as a queer retelling of the Cinderella myth. So taking objects from the story and giving them a shift in scale, a giant slipper, massive earrings, and a tiny carriage, and using these objects to create a non-linear -lin narrative. Uh, these are two more uh, uh, jewellery patterns uh, from the 18th century by Gilles Vergari. Uh, they're both hair ornaments that would have been attached to the front of a padded wig. These are the first works that I made using these patterns. This pair is called Golden Showers and they're about three feet in length. The gold colour comes from uh, gold Easter egg foil. I cast the glass for these works around Easter time. Someone had just given me some chocolate eggs for Easter. I was playing around with the gold foil and tried putting some behind the glass, which had an almost alchemical effect, creating the soft velvet luminosity. 
another piece using the same um, Le Carré pattern. This one is called uh, Purple Rain, and it's my homage to the song by Prince. The glass is backed by the, the glass is backed with purple Easter egg foil, and this piece is about four and a half feet in length. A detail of purple rain. And then this work is the largest and most recent one I made using the Lugari pattern. This is called uh, Stardust and Moonlight. And, but instead of using Easter egg foil, I use uh, the crystal here, it's backed with regular old Reynolds brand silver aluminum foil. The piece is, this uh, piece is about uh, six feet high. Another source of inspiration for me comes from jewellery worn, uh, worn in old master portraits. This is uh, King Henry VIII's, King Henry VIII of England's third wife, Jane Seymour, painted by Hans Holbein in 1535. The brooch worn by Jane Seymour bears the initials of Christ in Greek lettering. I recreated the brooch, but scrambled the letters to spell B-U-T-C-H, butch, and the title of this work is Big Girl. It's a detail of Big Girl. In 2002, I moved to the US to begin grad study at, at MassArt in Boston. One of the benefits of being in Boston was the diversity of museums. Include, including the Harvard Natural History Museum, which houses the extraordinary collection of glass flowers that were created in the 19th century by Leopold and Rudolf Blaschke, an East German father and son who had a thriving business supplying museums with glass specimens. In addition to making the glass flowers, the Blaskers also made exquisite marine specimens like jellyfish, sea slugs, and sea worms. Through the Blaskers, I learned of the 19th century zoologist Ernst Haeckel, seated in the image on the far left. Haeckel was one of the first scientists to stare through a microscope and try and record what he saw. This was the era before photography, and Haeckel was attempting to draw the ephemeral microorganisms he saw. In addition, Haeckel looked into the ocean and, and made incredible studies of jellyfish. On the right is Haeckel's study for jellyfish he discovered and named a disco medusa. Disc in ancient Greek meaning circular and medusa, the Greek word for jellyfish. For my thesis project at MassArt, I decided to ex exploit the chandelier-like qualities of Haeckel's Disco Medusa. I blew up the image of the jellyfish to use as my pattern and then broke it down into forms that I could reproduce. I wanted a glass-like material, but something more, more forgiving than glass and something I could use on a last large scale. I found this amber-colored rubber, which was strong enough to be stitched together using monofilament fishing line. I modeled the forms in clay and made simple two-part plaster molds and cast each form in rubber repeatedly. This rubber is normally used for making rubber molds and therefore discarded, but it had such, such fabulous qualities. I wanted to use it as uh, in the final product. This is the Disco Medusa complete in my thesis show at MassArt in 2004. And a detail of the work. There were lights inside the central lantern, uh, which, uh, which illuminated it. In 2006, I had my first solo show in New York. And for that show, I decided to make three new jellyfish. This is a clay model for one of the forms that was about to be molded. And another clay model for one of the, the jellyfish, a Cuba Medusa jellyfish, 
a, a species also discovered and named by Haeckel. These are the uh, cast rubber skins that make up the Cuba Medusa. And this time, rather than the amber colored uh, rubber, I went for a clear silicon rubber. Some more rubber forms that have been stitched, that have been cast in, in separate parts and then stitched together. And here's me making the armature using copper tubing from Home Depot um, that will support the uh, Cuba Medusa. Medusa. These are two sections that, that will make up that work, the top mantle that will sleeve over the standing structure. And another view of the, the, the mantle form uh, as I'm beginning to stitch the skins over the structure. Making a second large disco medusa. This is the internal structure for that form the copper tube soldered and riveted together. These are the finished works at, uh, when they arrived at the gallery in New York. Beginning the installation within the gallery. And then this is the work installed. I, I titled the, the, the show Villa Medusa after the house that Ernst Haeckel had built for himself. Medusa also referred to the Gorgon of ancient Greek mythology, a woman of terrifying beauty who had the curse of turning all men who looked into her eyes into stone. It's a detail of the Cuba Medusa. And looking up inside that form, the works were lit with a combination of fiber optics and incandescent bulbs, mimicking the bioluminescence that some je jellyfish possess, which enables them to lure food their way. This is the large Medusa and the second Cuba Medusa. The large, the large Medusa measured nine feet in diameter and weighs about 800 pounds. There's about a thousand cast elements that go into that piece, stitched stitch together using monofilament fishing line. That's the view you got from standing underneath it. In 2008, I made a trip home to Australia. My, my partner is American and it was his first time visiting Australia. I really wanted to show him the Great Barrier Reef. We spent an amazing week swimming, swimming with tropical fish and observing coral of all different colors and species. Sadly, we also saw some of the first examples of coral bleaching to affect the reef, which was begin, beginning to happen due to the warming of the ocean and through climate change. When I got back to, to the US, I started thinking about new work, uh, researching coral, uh, researching cabinets of curiosity and thinking about combining some of those images with the patterns of 18th, 18th century jewellery that I'd collected. I saw this as, as an homage to these complex sensitive life forms that are in danger of disappearing. This is one of the first of those works made of nickel plated bronze and mirrored blown glass. It's about uh, six feet in diameter sorry, six feet in, in length. Two, two works on the wall in, in my studio. This shot gives a, a bit of a scale reference. Uh, the ceiling in my studio was seven feet high and the piece on the left, I could just um, fit it on the wall. Combining the 18th century hair ornament pattern um, with uh, 19th century studies of coral. I call this series of works Gorgonia, which is the name of a species of coral fan. And this was Gorgonia 4. 
that's a, a detail of that work. And uh, this, this work was made using the same, uh, the same vertical hair ornament pattern, but stretching it horizontally. This is Gorgonia 10. And a detail of that work. It, it was about nine feet wide. In 2018, I got, I got to exhibit five works in the Adelaide Biennial at the Art Gallery of South Australia. I wanted to make a new work that was inspired by this magnificent screen that was made in the mid 17th century by a Japanese painter, Kano Sansetsu. It shows an old plum tree snaking its way across a field of gold leaf. Thinking about the image of the old distorted plum tree seemed to me like an uncanny symbol for the Fukushima nuclear power plant that melted down after the tsunami struck in 2011. Separated only by the Pacific Ocean, I was living in California at the time where we received tsunami warnings that same day. It was sad and disturbing to learn the full extent of the disaster and the leaking of radioactive water into the ocean and imagining what effect that would have on marine life. I made a, a pattern for work based on the old plum tree and then cut up that pattern and rearranged it into a symmetrical form. Then I modeled the forms in plasticine And then the plasticine is rubber molded and the and 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 wax models are, are cast from those molds. Then the uh, the the cast the, the wax is cast in, in bronze in the foundry. Uh, these are some of the rough bronze castings that have just come back. Uh, beginning beginning the, the fine finishing or chasing as it is called in foundry speak. And beginning to assemble the work according to the pattern. Another section being ass assembled and welded together. And then beginning to attach the glass elements. hanging the work on the wall in my studio for the first time. And then the work as it appeared in the Adelaide Biennial. This piece, I think it was uh, about seven feet high and uh, eight feet wide. And these are four of the five works that I had in the Adelaide Plain. So last year, I was invited to be part of a show at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC. The show was called Forces of Nature, and there were four artists. It was a beautiful space to exhibit in. I got to show five works that I'd made over from, from over the years. This was one of the works. It's, it's a recent work called Tree of Heaven 7. And in, in making this work, I was combining the 18th century hair ornament pattern with Haeckel's 19th century studies of lichen. That's a detail of Tree of Heaven 7.
another of the works was a chandelier that I made back in 2008 for a show called Bitter Sweet at the Museum of Fine Arts in San Francisco. That's a detail of the chandelier that I made using crystallized rock sugar. It was inspired by an 18th century rock crystal chandelier that belongs in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in San Francisco. When I was preparing for the exhibition in San Francisco, I learned that the museum had been built by a woman of the name of Alma Spreckles, pictured there on the left. Alma had been born into near poverty in San Francisco in 1881. She'd worked in a laundry and in her spare time served as an artist model. Alma was tall and considered a great beauty of her day. In a Cinderella-like transformation, Alma met and eventually married one of the richest men in the world, a guy called Adolf Spreckles. Spreckles' fortune had come from children cropping. His family owned most of Hawaii at the time. And when I learned this tale, I felt that sugar somehow needed to be an ingredient in the work that I was going to make for Bittersweet. The image on the right is a portrait of Tsarina Catherine the Great, who, who ruled Russia during the 18th century. Catherine had begun life as a princess in an obscure German principality, but was married off to a Russian duke and used her intelligence and connections to, to concentrate her power. And as empress, her reign is considered, is considered the golden age of Russia. Catherine was a great patron of the arts, a friend to Voltaire, and believed in vaccination against disease. So a very modern woman of thought. One of Catherine's, uh, Catherine, Catherine the Great's uh, legacies was a room entirely decorated in, pan in panels of amber. The Amber Room, as it became known, was one of the eight wonders of the world. It survived intact in a palace near St. Petersburg until the Second World War, when this photo was probably taken. During the war, the Nazi army invaded and looted the palace. They wrenched the amber panels off the walls and packed them in crates and hauled them away, where they uh, stored them most, most likely in a military castle in Germany. The fate of the amber, amber panel is not entirely certain, though it is thought that um, they most likely perish in a fire. The, the exhibition um, that I've mounted at Higgins Gallery is inspired in part uh, by those events. This, uh, I see this as a reimagining of Catherine the Great's Amber Room. And here's some video footage showing um, two, of the, two of three of the works in the show. So um, both of these works are made using the uh, amber colored rubber that I used for the first jellyfish. The rubber is normally used to make molds and then discarded. The overall forms relate to 18th century Rococo wall sconces designed by Thomas Chippendale. 
And the other work at Higgins uh, in Amber Room is, is the carriage that I made originally for the show in San Francisco. The carriage is based on an 18th century uh, Rococo design. The cabin, for the cabin of the carriage, I made a plywood shell, then added some carved phone panels and created a ro Rococo scroll, scroll work using scrunched up aluminum foil, hot glued in place. This is the armature for the carriage pretty much complete. The profiles for the wheels were cut in plywood and fleshed out using aluminum foil and the chassis is made of steel. Applying uh, the sugar to the surface of the carriage, I used large chunks of rock sugar for the panels and finer sugar crystals for the scrolled areas. The amber color comes from shellac, which I used to seal the sugar. Shellac is a natural lacquer. This is a, a time-lapse video showing the carriage being assembled. I've got a, a second video of the carriage just showing some of the details of the interior. And this is the final image. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them into the Zoom chat for Natalie and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank, thank you so much, Tim. So we, we are questions. Um, and in fact, I'm, I'm gonna start by uh, the first one uh, that, um, um, Yes, yeah, so someone is saying, what are the pearls made of? Mm -hmm. uh, the pearls are made from mirrored blown glass. So uh, when I was um, studying glass and um, I, I began researching the manufacture of artificial pearls and discovered that um, in the 18th century, France had set up an in industry creating artificial pearls using um, tubes of using um, tubes of, of glass and uh, heating it in a Bunsen burner and forming a little pearl shape on the end and, uh, and then um, coloring that glass using the, the, the nacreous pigments of um, fish, fish scales. So that inspired me to make some large, uh, large pearls using mirrored blown using blown glass and after um, exploring several techniques came up with with uh, the technique of using a small amount of op opaque color and blowing that color um, really thin so it kind of looked like um, if you if you poured milk into a glass and then poured poured the milk out it, it would let, leave a sort of uh, like a translucent residue um, that's kind of what the color looks like when it's um, when it's in the glass and uh, then um, when that glass is then mirrored on the inside, 
it creates a, an optical pearlescence. Thank you, Tim. And so I have another question. Um, someone is asking, do you work with assistants? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And it came up um, actually um, when I was talking to a class yesterday. And um, I, 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 um, I, I haven't worked with assistants, not yet. Um, maybe moving forward as, as I get older, maybe I will really appreciate having some some assistance help me in the studio. Um, but that said, I do get a lot of assistance um, with um, pe uh, the people who I work with um, in other ways. So the bronze casting foundry that I, that I use in order to um, cast the bronze elements in my works, um, I would consider them assistance really because they do such a fabulous job um, in uh, taking the models that I make and um, translating those into bronze. Um, I also, I don't blow glass myself anymore. Um, I uh, stopped blowing glass when I moved to the US and, and started working with rubber. And um, so I um, work with a fabulous glass blower in Seattle called Janusz Pozniak, who um, blows, blows the glass elements for, for these works. And so the, the next uh, question is, in fact, from Lucy Clark, but uh, you know, <laughs> she, she's asking, she says, how, how do you stitch the pieces together? What kind of thread and stitches do you use? Uh -huh. um, so yes, yeah, so, so with the rubber works, I was using mono fisherman, monofilament fishing line. Um, and I, um, so the, uh, the reason I, I, I guess I came up with the, the fishing line was because it was transparent and I didn't want it to be seen and also it's strong, it has a, a high tensile um, factor. Um, and also I kind of like the notion that um, it, um, ha fishing line has a connection to the sea and, and uh, it seemed to fit with the jellyfish. Um, so I was using a, a, like a large darning needle and, um, and it was kind of like making a, an enormous ball gown um, I would uh, just take it slowly and um, just use a, a very simple kind of um, blanket stitch to, to uh, construct the works and assemble them. And then the next question um, we have is in fact um, a student, uh, Meredith Ward, who is asking, what inspired you to be an artist? Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Um, so I grew up. Um, I I always kind of loved drawing and making things when when I was a kid, but I didn't really um, see it as being something that I would do later in life or you know something that make it make it a career. Um, I when I was um, twelve years old, I fell in love with horses, and um, I think my parents were kind of really glad that I um, was, was doing something and they um, thought that I would have a career with horses. And so when I was in school, they, um, they influenced my, my subject, the, the, the courses that I took the subjects towards um, maths and science and, and thinking that I would be kind of going into, um, I don't know, vet science or, or going to agricultural college or something like that. And, um, but when I was um, 17 and in, in my final year of high school, my father um, uh, took early retirement from, from his job and he moved to, so we moved from Melbourne to Queensland, which was kind of like the retirement Florida of Australia. And so it was a big kind of upheaval for the family. And um, I realized the horse, I didn't, I just didn't think I could have a career with horses. Um, I just didn't sort of see it, that it, it being sustainable. And um, I uh, decided I was going to take art classes in my final year of high school. And they were the classes that I enjoyed the most. And um, I really got a lot of support from the staff that I had. And they encouraged me to go to art school. And um, I, growing up, I, I knew a couple of artists and um, so it kind of, um, I, it, it, in the end, it kind of happened organically. 
So the, the next question we have is, uh, what are you working on right now? Um, I'm, um, at the moment, um, I've been uh, reworking some, some drawings that I did um, years ago, but never really did, any, did anything with. And so that was, that's kind of been my, my COVID project. Um, and uh, my partner and I, we recently uh, bought a house and um, that also became a bit of a, a COVID project um, uh, because we couldn't have builders here doing renovations. And so I kind of became the, the, uh, the renovator. Um, and I also uh, uh, converted the garage into a studio for me to work in. Um, so I now have a beautiful space and I'm just um, getting back into some, some new work. Um, the works that are actually on the wall behind Natalie, um, I, that, that is a sort of a, a territory that I want to sort of re-explore, um, these the, the sort of 18th century um, sconces and mirror forms. Um, but I think I want to, instead of using rubber, I think I want to sort of um, use uh, glass and, and metal this time. Or may, maybe not even metal, maybe use glass, but maybe some, um, some uh, more direct um, modeling materials. So the, 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 there's a question, in fact, about the rubber. Um, how long will the rubber last? Um, the, the, so the, the, the amber rubber is polyurethane rubber, and it's, 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 I, it's, I think it's virtually indestructible. It's supposed to be, I think it is a bit photosensitive, so it's not supposed to be stored too close to light. Um, but uh, that said, I, um, I tested a piece and just kept it on a windowsill for a couple of years and it didn't alter in any way. Um, and, uh, and those pieces, I made those back in 2005. So they're now 16 years old and they haven't really altered in any way. So I, I think they're, they're, um, they're going to be pretty durable. So now, now I have a, a question that uh, might not be so easy to answer. It's mm -hmm. from Bob Henry and he's saying, I can't imagine what you learned when you got your MFA. I do imagine that you got a lot of encouragement, but what else? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually doing the, the MFA was, um, well, you know, I mean, um, I learned to work with rubber. So I hadn't worked with rubber before. And, and that really was my, my thesis project was to, um, and actually I, I actually made the, the forms for, for those two sconce pieces um, whilst I was at Massard. And but they were really complicated and I had no idea how to go about casting them. So I, I put them aside and I um, started making the disc, disco medusa instead. And um, what I, and that took almost a year to, to make. And um, in making that work, um, it, it gave me the courage then to go back to those two, two sconce pieces and, um, and make the molds and, and, and cast them. Then we, we have another question from uh, Sean Robertson. Um, she, she says, you said that as a student, you initially planned to create jewelry, but felt that sculpture was a better fit for you. Your yeah. work still references uh, uh, many forms of jewelry. And I'm wondering if you see the pieces as jewelry on a massive scale. Um, yeah, I, um, I, had I, had, I, had I stuck with jewelry, I had no idea what I, what, what I would have made. Um, I, I found working on that tiny scale, um, it just, it, it, it didn't interest me. I was more sort of, um, I, 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 couldn't, um, I couldn't contain myself within, with, within making a tiny scale or making something practical to be worn. Um, I guess I, I had kind of gone into jewelry, not really considering what, what that that discipline really sort of encompassed, and um, so sculpture just just felt like a the, the physicality the, the scale of sculpture just was a better fit for me. I, I really enjoyed um, working with clay and um, you know kind of using my hands rather than than using sort of fine dental tools on a, on a tiny scale. Just working with 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 much larger things. The the 
the gesture of, of, of sculpture. It's, I guess it's like paint, it's like painting. Um, and, um, but that decorative um, nature of, um, of uh, historical jewelry was, is clearly in my DNA. And it, um, and there I was kind of, you know, and it surfaced when I went back to school to study glass. So, so there I was studying glass, um, but I ended up making jewelry or, or glass jewelry that's really sculpture or I see as sculpture anyway. So um, I, um, yeah, I guess, I guess for me, I'm, I'm not motivated to make um, wearable art work or, or wearable jewelry. So maybe that, that's the, the, the distinction I see. And, and that's not to put jewelry down at all. I, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by contemporary jewelry and, and have, have um, great respect for it. And uh, um, we have we have, we still have a, a few more questions. Um, and the next one is is from um, uh, uh, Dean uh, McCarran, mm -hmm. and uh, she's asking. You said that you have been inspired not only by nature and by historical figures, but also by famous works by Japanese landscape artists and Hans Holbein. For the students in the audience. Uh, to what extent is it important to study classical art if you want to be an artist? Well, that's that's a, that's a pretty good question. Um, look, I, you know, for me, I, I'm I, I'm I, I go into that question being so biased because um, history has always been really important to me, and um, and it was one of the delights of being at art school was attending art history classes. And um, and Bob Henry mentioned, you know, one, what what did you get out of, um, of of an MFA? And I I I look, I'm an art school junkie. I spent 11 years at art school, and and I'd I'd still be at art school if I could be. I really enjoyed the interaction with, you know, my fellow students and my staff and and uh, professors, and um, and just that ability or the the availability to um, have access to uh, facilities and equipment and um, learn techniques and, and learn you know just osmotically from from um, other students um, that's that's such a that's such a privilege uh, or uh, such a luxury these days um, because because study is so expensive um, so um, yeah I for me, for me it, it for me it's it's crucial it's um, it's what informs my work I I don't feel like um, I'm one of those artists who begins with a blank canvas and uh, and and and, cr and my creativity comes and my my creativity comes um, from or I, or I wait for that creativity to come um, I'm someone who is not that spontaneous I require a lot of input so it it I, I need to sort of immerse myself in books and writing literature, um, uh, nonfiction books, uh, history, travel, um, drawings, whatever. I, I need I need I need a lot of kind of um, materials that, that I let them compost, and um, and and I feel that that um, helps me access my creativity. So we have, we have now the next question is from a student, um, Nicole Osland, and she's asking, have you ever thought about doing a large sculpture piece with rainbow colors embracing pride? Um, so that's, that's a question. She's, she's wondering if you would create, for example, coral and jellyfish with um, um, rainbow colors. Um. Uh, yeah, I um, well, I'm actually colorblind, and um, so I've always struggled with color, and um, in terms of how to apply that to an artwork. So, a lot of the time, um, it, it's one of the reasons, what sadly, why I didn't become a painter as much as you know, I'm, I was a wannabe painter, um, but um, 
it, all my attempts at painting seem to sort of mis fail miserably in, into just sort of murky, muddy colours. Um, so I, um, I avoided colour, using colour in, in sculpture, and or, or maybe that was one of the benefits of use, using, working in, in three dimensions was if uh, I, I was either relying on the inherent colour in the material itself or um, or else um, something or al just allowing the the color to occur naturally um, like in, in just un unpatternated bronze um, but um, uh, so so really the only time I've really used color was um, using it in uh, using it as in foil behind glass and um, somehow it was it it it, it, it made the, the 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 foil was almost like a um it wasn't a paint so i wasn't kind of having to uh, ha ha i still wasn't having to deal with mixing color you know i was kind of just applying color in this big um flat field uh, which i which gave me confidence to, to do it i didn't really have to consider it too much other than um, I think the the colors I was using color. I was making a conscious decision with the color um, to fit the form of, of of the particular work. So for the glass slipper, I wanted that to be pink um, glass. Uh, sorry, pink foil. For the for purple rain, I wanted that that um, that uh, foil to be purple. Um, for golden showers, I wanted the 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 foil to be gold, and for um, stardust and moonlight, I, I wanted it to be just silver. And so now we have another question from uh, Robert Rinder, and and uh, Robert is asking, do you ever exhibit your drawings? Um, uh, hi Bob. Um, that's a that's a that's a good question. Um, I um, no, I've I don't think I've ever um, actually exhibited drawings, um, uh, I, and that, and that is something I really, would really like to do do with um, the drawings that I'm working on at the moment um, is is have a works on show paper. So yeah, hopefully sometime soon coming up. So then we have somebody else who is asking. Have you been approached by confectioners? Spun sugar would seem like a likely medium. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I haven't had the good fortune of, of being um, a, approached by some confe by any confectioners. Um, yeah, look, may, may, maybe that will be the um, I, I, maybe that will be the the fate of these works where they finally um, end up. I don't, you know, I kind of made these works not, not, uh, these, these works were commissioned by the museum in San Francisco. So I didn't, um, my, my concern was, was making them a work um, that, uh, that they would be interested in. So it, it didn't, I, I didn't have to make work that had a direct commercial um, uh, a, a direct uh, commercial um, incentive um, but um, and and you know they've, they've been, they've been, they've been, these works have been shown um, several times now and and they've actually held together really well um, but there probably will come a time where they um, I would like to retire them and um, maybe they will if, if they ended up in some fabulous Willy Wonka um, uh, you know, sweet emporium. Um, I'd be, I'd be kind of happy with that too. I don't think they're, 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 they're going to be high maintenance. Uh, um, they, 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 you know, they, they will require. Uh, you know, they've held together really well, but they will probably require some maintenance at some stage. So then, uh, the next que question is from uh, a student, uh, Eleonore um, Ele. And she, she says, when you are working on projects, uh, what does your studio practice look like? 
how, how do you structure your time, especially for projects that are two years in the making? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, uh, that's uh, that's a, a, a really good consideration. So um, I'll, I'll use the, the sugar as an example. Um, when I was making that work for, for the um, San, Fr San Francisco show, uh, originally I they did, the museum had given me um, about uh, I think a year and a half to, to sort of consider making the work, and then. They said that um, a slot had opened up um, for the, the for the following summer period, and um, that it would have been an optimal time to have the show, and so that that um, that reduced my working time to eight months. So um, originally, I sort of planned to give myself at least twelve months. Um, suddenly, I had eight months, and um, so I just decided, okay, I'll just um, work uh seven days a week um but i'll keep it nine to five and and i'll get it done and um so that's that was kind of the routine i had i just you know worked um worked every day um uh seven days a week and um and i was going right up until the last day when i was um the last week, I think I was making the crates. Um, the last day, I was picking up the the sixteen foot budget truck from from uh, the, the rental truck truck from budget, and packing the truck, and um, then getting up at two a.m. the next morning and driving to uh, spending the next three days driving to San Francisco across the desert from um, San Santa Fe where I was living. Um, so yeah, for me, that's I you know, as an artist, um, we don't always get to kind of call the shots, and um, we kind of have to do what we can, what we can for the opportunity. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think I think that's fairly typical for the way I, I tend to work. I, I need some I, I need an opportunity to to work towards something like that. Um, I find it really hard to to concentrate, focus, get myself motivated, unless I've got something, a project to, to with, with, a, with, a, with an end date to, to work on. So, so we, we have lots of wonderful comments. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, we have people who say wonderful work, thank you for sharing. Tim's work is exquisite uh, over Zoom. Um, and, and so that's uh, our Dean who is saying, but it's even more spectacular in person. So uh, please make sure you come next Thursday from five to seven. And uh, so you will see the, the real thing. Uh, it's, it's really fantastic. Um, so um, I would like to thank Tim so much for today, for uh, bringing his work to our college for our students and our community. And uh, I would also like to thank our technicians at the Tilden Center who helped us to put this event together. And I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, and please do not hesitate, come to the gallery um, during the week, um, either if it's Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, or you can call me and, and I will meet you at the gallery to see this amazing show. Um, so thank you so much and have a lovely rest of the afternoon. Thanks everyone.